Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Off Farm Income Podcast. Thank you very much for joining us here again on our YouTube channel for episode number 766. Well, today I would like to talk about, I don't know, agricultural and rural people and their level of happiness. I've touched on this a little bit before, but since this is a Tuesday edition episode, this is something that just has been occurring to me. It's kind of been a thought that's been in my head. And I wanted to get it down on paper and and share it with you and see what you think. And uh, this strays into territory that I don't go to into uh, very often, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and go into it today. I think there's a point to be made here about this, and I think it's something that uh, you sharing values with me uh, about agriculture, about rural life, rural living. I think you'll recognize, and and hopefully, what I'm saying is true if the scenarios I describe were to ever come to fruition. So let's talk about a clock really quick. Let's talk about a clock. Have you ever looked at the U- United States National Debt Clock? You can pull this up on the internet. You can look at it. And there's all these different clocks, if you will, these digital readouts that are that are rapidly moving. The numbers are rapidly changing. And it's actually pretty fascinating. It's hard to keep up with because there's so many different readouts. And it would be really fun to just kind of watch this thing go. Like I can I can imagine like a toddler or even a baby looking at the screen and just being fascinated with all the movement and the different colors and things like that. So it would be really cool to watch all the figures changing and adding up so quickly. If you weren't just slapped right across the face with the fact that these numbers were true, and our national debt was now about $23 trillion. Now, you might be wondering, how does this relate to farmers and agricultural and rural people being some of the most hap- happiest and contented people in America? I will get to that. Okay. Now, have you ever looked into the average net worth of Americans? And you know what I mean when I say net worth. I mean all of your assets, your house, your savings, retirement, all of that minus all of your liabilities, your mortgage, your car payment, your student loan debt, consumer debt, all of that. If you have, then you have seen another number, and that is that the average net worth in America is right around $692,000. Now, that number looks pretty good. When you look at the average net worth of people in America working on getting up to a million dollars when we're talking about retirement, when you can no longer work and support yourself, Good, that's a decent nest egg to have. But that's the average number. And in this case, the average number is not the best number because what the, at least the the statisticians say, is that the super ultra wealthy, the billionaires in the United States of America really skew that number and it pushes it way upward. So rather than using the average net worth in America, we're going to look at the median net worth, which is what falls right in the median, which means half of Americans have a net worth less than this number, and half of Americans have a net worth higher than this number. And that number is 97,300. Now, hopefully, people who are getting ready to retire are on the side of that number that is larger, and we're just going to call it $100,000 for right now. And hopefully it's the very young, you know, people right in their 20s um, who are at that $100,000 number. And I have seen some encouraging news recently, which is that this latest generation, what is it? uh, Is it Z? Generation Z? I don't even know. But it's the youngest generation. They are saving at a more rapid pace than their, their prior generation. So hopefully that is true. But this median number of net worth being right at $100,000. Think about that going into your retirement if you want to retire. Like and and some of us, some of us like me, I don't really see a point in time where I'm going to stop working. That has nothing to do with need, it has to do with I finally am doing something that I really enjoy doing. I'm not doing a job that is kind of a grind to go to. So I want to continue to do this. It's fun. I like producing the content. I get something intrinsic out of what I do for a living. And so I see no reason why I will ever stop. But there will come a point in time where I probably have to stop. And at that point, I do need to have taken care of myself in such a manner and my family in such a manner that we can go into that period of life. You can call that retirement if you want with dignity, with the ability to still be self-sufficient, self-reliant, all of that. Well, if, if at that point my net worth was $100,000, 
just looking at what things cost today, that's a problem, right? That is a, that's an issue. Hopefully, you have a paid off house at that point, paid off farm, whatever that is. Uh, but still, at a hundred thousand uh, dollars, just property taxes in several years are going to eat all that up. I guess it would take a while, uh, but property taxes, vehicle expenses, insurance, all this type of stuff. So you want to be beyond that. So that's not a great number. And then the next number I want to look at is average credit card debt in America. And of course, if the previous number could be skewed, this number could be skewed a little bit as well. Um, but if you look, I, and I guess the average I shouldn't have used, let's look at total credit card debt in America. In 2019, total credit card debt in the United States exceeded $1 trillion. It went over $1 trillion. And this does not include mortgages. This does not include student loans. And this does not include vehicle loans. This is consumer debt. Things people are buying with credit cards. Things that almost immediately lose their value and will need to be replaced soon. Now, you do not have to be a mathematician to realize that at some point in the future, something is going to have to change to rectify all of this. Our national debt is going to have to be paid off or at least significantly paid down. And at that time, there's going to be less money for things like Social Security, this retiring with dignity idea. Uh, so, and by the way, I don't even, I think most people in my generation, I'm 46, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't even, I don't even weigh or factor in Social Security into my retirement planning. Whatever I do get from Social Security when I reach that age, uh, that'll just be some sort of a little bonus cherry on top. I just don't even worry about it. Uh, so there will be less money for Social Security. And this means that individuals are going to be more reliant on that small median net worth during retirement. And with this consumer debt that's out there, plus mortgages, car payments, student loans, with this financial crunch, people are going to be less able to pay off that credit card debt and all those other debts. So I don't know if you can see where I'm going with this. It's not a wonderful view on the future of the United States, but with what we're doing piling up debt and what we're doing as, as a government, as a nation, and then what we're doing personally in terms of piling up debt, uh, overall, out, you know, overall, I'm not speaking for you. I'm not speaking for me. I'm talking as a population in general. This is, there has to be a point in time where something has to break. It has to be rectified. And I don't know how it'll look. I don't know how it'll look, but I will tell you that this has been something that I've thought about for years. And it goes back to when I was a police officer and I was seeing, I was seeing what was going on in the world. Of course, you get a you get a jaded view of the world as a police officer because you go you go and you deal with a certain percentage of the population over and over and over again, and everything starts to look like that's the way it works. And I know that's not true, but there was there is something interesting that I saw when I was a police officer. I want to I want to share my perspective with you from this. So. Now, over the past couple of decades, I have watched the decisions by our leaders, and I am talking Republican leaders and Democrat leaders, plunge us deeper and deeper into debt, and I have watched some politicians start to promise more and more and more free stuff to Americans when it's election time, when they are trying to get those votes. And for 15 years of this time, I was a police officer. And that meant that I was walking into a lot of houses on a daily basis where nobody there was working. But I looked around the house and very frequently they had a nicer television than me. They had nicer furniture than me. They had DVDs stacked up to the ceiling. They had tons of other consumer goods. And I'm looking around. And by the way, you might be asking, how do you know nobody's working? Well, as a police officer, when you fill out a report, there's certain information you have to get. And one of those pieces of information you always have to get is employer information. You want to know where this individual works. So when you're interviewing witnesses, interviewing people in a house because you're there taking a report or whatever it may be, you go through this form and you fill all of this out. Well, what happened, and by the way, I started my law enforcement career in 1996. 
from 1996 to 2013 when I left, and I know that's more than 13 years. I had a small break in there to go be herdsman on a cattle ranch up here in Idaho. Um, during that time, during that break, I went from getting the answer of a place of employment very, very frequently when I asked the question, where do you work, to, oh, I'm on disability, uh, oh, I got laid off, oh, this. Or the, uh, by the end of my career, and probably the last 10 years, it was, it, was a, it was a funny question to come to because when I first started my career, and I was young, and I was very respectful, and so I would never want to, I would always pose the question to people with the assumption that they did work because to me, that implied that I, I thought that, it implied dignity to me to, to, to go in with the pres- presumption that the person I was talking to had a job and they were producing in our culture. By the end of my career, I think I changed the way I asked that to, are you working right now? Because so often when I asked that question with the presumption that they were employed, it came back as almost shameful for them to answer, no, no, no. And I would, I would hear this long list of reasons why they don't work. And what's interesting too is when I started my career, it was, well, it was 1996. So it was just right around the time of that big welfare reform that went on with the Republican Congress and then, of course, Bill Clinton in office and and welfare reform happened. And then by the time I was wrapping up my career, I no longer heard about welfare. I heard about disability. And it, it seems like a lot of the ways that people who weren't going to work got their money, it shifted from welfare over to disability and they were getting disability payments. So welfare reform... If you wanted it reformed, uh, it looked like they did something significant in the 90s. Uh, but in the end, uh, I don't know that anything really changed uh, at, at a base level, at the level of me walking into a house in Boise, Idaho. So with that said, so often I would see folks in these homes with all these consumer goods, nicer consumer goods than me, than, than my wife and I had, We'd buy like used furniture, used televisions, used refrigerators, all this type of stuff to, in an effort to live below our means. And then you see politicians up there saying, free, 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 free. Elect me, you get this. Elect me, you get that. And then in these, in these homes, as I'm interviewing people, nobody has a job. And everybody's on disability or they've got a back injury and they, they can't stand at a convenience store and sell cigarettes all day or whatever. They just can't do it. Their, their back hurts in that way. And I know that's true for some people. But this was just over and over and over again. And during this time, I just could not help but do the math because there was another thing I was seeing that was just slapping me in the face. I'd, I'd walk into a trailer. I'd walk into an apartment, a house, whatever it was. And, if, and like I'm talking about, nobody was working, nobody had a job. And then I would learn that they were getting by with assistance from the government. So, for example, in Idaho, through the USDA, through the Farm Bill, of course, we have food stamps here. Uh, but they, they put them on a card called a Quest card. So this was done uh, to preserve the, uh, the self-esteem of folks who were relying on food stamps and the Farm Bill to get food for their family. So now instead of having those old, I don't know if you remember this, if you're me and you worked in a grocery store in the uh, 80s and 90s, you remember the old food stamps where they actually ripped out like monopoly money that said a one or a five or a 10 or whatever. Uh, That was uh, apparently too stigmatizing for folks. So now they've got a, what looks like a debit card or a credit card. Um, it says Quest on it. It's it, This is in Idaho, uh, and it's got uh, like a picture that's very familiar to the state of the mountains and pine trees and stuff like that. And they can just run that through and buy their food, and they don't have to rip off those special stamps. So um, as I'm walking into these houses as a police officer, um, there's a lot of people that are using the Quest card. And multiple individuals in the house have one. Uh, folks that they are on Section 8 housing. So somebody's paying like 80% of the rent for them. Uh, they have disability payments, SSI, Meta, Medicaid, I think is the one I'm thinking of. All this type of stuff uh, where the government is paying for everything. And as I look around in these homes 
and I would do my interviews and talk to people and kind of get an understanding of what's going on in the home as I was there to investigate whatever it was I was doing, I would learn that the head of the household was generally a woman. And this is not a gender statement. This is a statement of there was no there was no partner there. There was no husband. And I guess these days we would say there is no just partner, uh, whether that be uh, you know somebody of the same sex or somebody of the opposite sex. Uh, this woman was generally the head of the household and on her own uh, in these homes. Uh, no question about that. And by the way, everybody, this is Boise, Idaho. This is Boise we're talking about. This is not, I mean, Boise is not on the list of the most impoverished cities in the United States, but we still had our share here in Boise. So uh, I would learn that this woman who was about my age, she'd generally be about 35 to 45, somewhere in that range, uh, she was the head of the household. She had no partner helping her to support this household. Um, the father, generally, of all the kids running around, because biological fact, there's a father for those kids, uh, was long gone, was not there. Don't know where the father was. And then I would find out that this matriarch of this household would have four or five children. This frequently, frequently over the course of my entire career. Now, nothing wrong with having four or five kids at all. Matter of fact, I would love it if my family was that large. It's not. Uh, we have one daughter, and that is all we got, but we're very, very happy with Hattie. But anyway, uh, she would have four or five kids, but what struck me was she was my age, but the math went further than this. So she's my age. She has four to five times as many children as I do, but those kids are much, much older than my daughter. So at this point in time in my life, my daughter was anywhere from age 2 to age 10, we'll say, uh, 2 to age 7 or something like that. Uh, this lady, this stereotypical lady that I'm talking about as I walk into her house, her kids are 18, 19, 20, somewhere in there, maybe 17, maybe 16. And all this means is she got started having children much, much earlier than me. I didn't start till I was 33. That was a personal choice. Uh, kind of a personal choice and kind of a biological choice. Long story. Uh, but I didn't get started till I was 33. She got started when she was 16, 17, 18, right in there somewhere. And then her children, who many of which were living in the same house, but they are 17, 18, 19, 20, depending on this age range where you find this lady, if she's 40 or whatever it may be, uh, her kids already have a few kids as well. And I started to do the math on this because in this house, you never, you know, when you ask this question about employment, I never got the answer back. Um, man, we got applications out all over the place. Uh, John just finished up his certificate in spot welding or whatever. I don't know. And he's got a lot of good prospects. He did an internship. I never heard anything like that. Never. It was always all the reasons that they could not work. Never all the reasons why soon they were going to have a great job or what the future looked like for them in terms of them getting a great job. It was never that answer. It was always, here are all the reasons that I can't work. And by the way, here's all the reasons my son can't work as he's sitting on the couch, not helping around the house. The grass is, you know, a foot and a half tall out front. There's weeds everywhere, stuff piled up, trash, and he's playing video games. I should have mentioned video games on my uh, list of consumer goods in these homes. Uh, so he's playing video games. He's not helping around. And mom feels the obligation in the presence of a police officer to explain for her son, who could care less about what we think about him, uh, that, you know, oh, his back hurts, or he's got disability, or he's got, um, you know, oh, what's the one we heard all the time, um, bipolar, he's bipolar, or whatever that may be. And again, of course there's people with back injuries. Of course there's people with bipolar disorder, and it really affects their lives. Of course there is. But I heard it so very much. I know that there were times where this was a convenient way to get government assistance. So, this matriarch of the family, basically as I was taking down the names and date, uh, dates of birth of everybody who lived in the house, for every one of them, if I would go through this questionnaire, if they were of working age, asking if they're going to school, if they're working, if they're doing this or they're doing that, she felt the obligation, because she was of my generation, to justify why they were not doing something pro-social, why they were not doing something why they were not doing something productive for society rather than sitting there 
eating food all day in a house, playing video games, not even taking care of the home they lived in, you know, that type of stuff. And it dawned on me, it dawned on me that with this lady having, say, four times as many offspring as me and doing it in half the time it took me to have one, and then those kids repeating the cycle, having three to four times more offspring than me and doing it in half the time it took me to do one, it's an exponential equation. And everybody there, every single person in that house, once they turn 18, has the same right to vote as I do, the same right to vote as you do, and their vote counts exactly the same as yours, exactly the same as mine. But there's 12 people in this household that can vote, theoretically. There's two in my household. So obviously in any election, they are going to outvote us uh, 6 to 1, right? They're going to outvote us 6 to 1. So if they don't share the same values as, say, Autumn and I do, then our values are never going to be reflected in any election because they're going to outvote us every single time if they actually get out and go vote. Well, the math on this has always bugged me because I don't see the values that I have reflected in this house. I don't see anybody who's worried about work ethic. I don't see anybody who's worried about putting away for their future. I don't see anybody who's worried about having an emergency fund for when the air conditioner breaks. I don't see anybody uh, who has pride enough to go, I want to be self-reliant. I'm not seeing any of this in this house, but I know they can all vote. And then I think back to the politicians that I've been hearing saying, vote for me and you'll get more of this. Vote for me and you'll get more of that. I will give you this. I will give you that. Which so many politicians make these statements. They act like they forgot there's two other branches of government. And the odds of them really being able to do that aren't that great. But they're saying it and it's motivating people to vote for them. Because if we have a society where we're giving people free stuff and they've become reliant on it or they've decided that it's just easier to go through the you know the the easy road in life by not I don't know not pushing themselves not dealing with the resistance of trying to find a way to make it in the world on your own and be self-reliant if they've decided no I'm going to take this other easy road then of course they're going to vote for somebody who's going to give them more stuff because that's the only way for them to get more stuff and so as I sat there looking at this and doing this math, and, and you know, I used to ride, when I lived in the city, I'd ride my bike to and from work on my bike rides home after a long day of going into multiple houses like this. I'd be doing this math and thinking about it and kind of decompressing on this bicycle ride home and thinking about it <clears throat> and going, at what point does this catch up to us? Now, you got to think about voter turnout. And by the way, you guys, I, I know where I'm going on this. This is not a political episode. I'm not a political commentator. But I feel like I need to express this so you can understand my point. Um, so I'd be doing the math on this, and I'd be going, okay, well, the, the fact is, the fact is that we're lucky because I think when Election Day comes, very few of these folks are going to go through the effort, just like they won't go through the effort to go out and get a job or to get a certificate or do something to make them give them a leg up. They're not going to go out and go through the trouble of registering to vote and to go vote. But some of them will. It's just a very low percentage in my opinion. I don't know if that's right or wrong. But then it dawned on me, well, it's just a matter of time then because it's just a matter of percentages, right? They are, if, if this lady who's my same age, if she's got four kids and 12 grandkids, that's 16 humans that she's essentially brought into the world to my one. 16 to my one. And if two of them go vote, that's one out of eight voting turnout. That's not a great voting turnout, but it's still more than my one, uh, my one daughter. So what's interesting is that eventually, as this population of folks that are being that are growing up and having this value set that doesn't involve work ethic, that doesn't involve self-reliance, as this number gets larger and larger and larger and larger, because again, she's produced 15 humans to my one, 
as this number gets larger and larger and larger pretty soon, it's just a matter of percentages. Even if they have an extremely low voter turnout from people with this value set, they're still going to outnumber people like you and me. Because maybe many of us have waited till later in life to start our families. Maybe we wanted to accomplish some things before we felt it was right for us to bring another human into this world. Who knows? Or maybe if we started early, we had two or three kids, but they're going to wait until later. And we're getting outpaced by folks. Now, I don't know when these two numbers will collide. When, uh, even at a 10% at a voter turnout for uh, this group of people I'm talking about, at what point they will have a large enough number of folks to where folks who want to be self-sufficient, want to be self-reliant and do all that, can still win in elections. I don't know when that's going to take place. I don't know how close we are now. To me, it feels like we're close. It feels like we're close now, but I don't know. I don't know for sure, but what I do know is this. If these trends continue, then eventually we will have politicians that will promise the moon to people to get elected, and there'll be enough people to overshadow those of us who have a work ethic and want to be self-reliant to always elect the politicians who are promising that, and it will create this negative feedback loop to where that's what our culture, our country will change to. That I know, because it can't go any other way. There's no other way that it can go. Now, things can happen in the meantime to intervene, but if those things don't happen, and by the way, I don't know what those things are. It could be a pandemic. It could be this coronavirus thing or whatever. I don't know. Uh, I hope that's not what happens. I don't want to see people suffer or or die or anything like that. Um, but but short of something like that, that's the direction we're going, because the math works. You can't. There's nothing you can do about the math. There there's going to be many more people raised like this than there are productive members of society who value things like work ethic, self reliance, education, all of that. Sorry, I know this is a dismal view of the future. I have no idea when this finally happens. But essentially, folks with these values that all of us are in agriculture and in rural living have, at least those of us in this audience, well, we're going to become the minority, and I think it's happening pretty quick. I don't know that we can see it yet, but I do think it's happening pretty quick, just based on these numbers. And this combination of political candidates and folks with these values, that is going to lead us down. And by the way, with the massive national debt we have, all of this just coming together is going to create a combination of negative economic forces in this country. And it ultimately has to lead. I don't see any other answer. It has to lead to much, much higher taxes. It has to lead to much higher taxes. I think the other potential things it could lead to are much more devastating than much, much higher taxes. And so my guess would be that as Americans, we will accept the much higher taxes because the alternatives when this day comes are going to be very, very bleak in comparison to paying more in taxes. All right. Speaking of paying the bills, let me talk about my sponsors really quick, everybody. Man, this is a bleak episode. I'm usually so optimistic. I will get there, I promise. Uh, I want to talk, of course, about Powder River Livestock Handling Equipment. Just a great sponsor. So proud to have them as a sponsor of the show and have been now for years. I have been following and just knowing about this brand just kind of through osmosis for decades now, knowing how great of livestock handling equipment they produce. And now there is Powder River Squeeze Shoots panels on our farm. We run our cattle through them. As a matter of fact, we had a new calf yesterday, and Mama has got a lot of milk. She may be finding herself in that squeeze shoot here very shortly. I'm uh, going to check on her this morning once the sun gets up and see how she is looking. Uh, but with that said, with that said, we've got them right here on our farm. We want you to as well. Please let your local farm and ranch retailer know that you want to see Powder River Livestock Handling Equipment right there on your farm, on their lot, so you can buy their equipment for your farm. All right, and then Lacrosse. Oh, my goodness, so happy to have Lacrosse as a sponsor. Lacrosse Footwear, absolutely second to none, second to none. Uh, you know about our search for the right neoprene-based rubber boot. 
and I finally found it in lacrosse, and then about a year and a half after that, they became a sponsor of the show. We use the Alpha Range boots from lacrosse uh, here on our farm. All three of us do. They are definitely built to work as hard as you, ideal for chores around the house and farm. They are waterproof, comfortable, and, of course, available for both men and women. So please check them out over at lacrossefootwear.com. <clears throat> All right. So I'm painting this negative, this bleak picture, and so I am not the type of person to just sit there and say how bad things are, and I'm not sitting here saying they're that bad at this point. I'm just saying a little inside baseball information for you that this is definitely going on and the math just does not work in our favor. So I'm not the type of person to sit there and, and complain or say something's bad without offering a solution. But with that said, I have I have sat there in my own mind, and I'm not a brilliant person. I'm not a politician. I'm not a political scientist. So maybe I'm just not equipped to come up with a solution. But in my mind, I cannot come up with a solution. Now, I've got a couple crazy ideas, but uh, we've been doing this podcast for five years now. I think on the 10-year anniversary I may uh, feel comfortable enough knowing you all well enough to tell you some of my crazy ideas. Uh, but I, I have always worried about the day when these chickens are going to come home to roost. And I don't know if it's going to be in my lifetime. I suspect it will be, uh, but I don't know. But when, when pessimism gets the best of me, I think that it's probably going to happen right about the time that I'm ready to start enjoying the fruits of my labor. That's what I think. And <laughs> this is obviously a pessimistic glass half empty view of things. Uh, I have done everything that I've been told about financial security uh, for all my life or at least most of my life. So uh, we've invested for retirement. Uh, we've lived below our means. Uh, we've purchased appreciating assets like our farm, uh, like cattle. Uh, uh, we've purchased uh, rental houses as appreciating and uh, passive income generating assets. Uh, we have suppressed our lifestyle in order to put away for the future uh, when I either cannot or I guess if the time ever comes, I don't want to work any longer. We've done all that, right? And we've struck a balance. We could. Uh, I have friends who've put away more than me, uh, but they have really suppressed their lifestyle. And I'm not willing to do that uh, because, you know, God can push the off button anytime he wants. And so you want to live a little bit now, but you want to be able to live with integrity later as well. So you got to find that balance. Now, the pessimistic side tells me that around the time I'm ready to stop working. So it's, it's that this is when it's going to go bad and it's going to collapse. This is me just thinking, you know, the world's against me. Now, I don't really live my life that way, but when I get pessimistic, I go, this is finally going to come to fruition right around the time I'm ready to retire. And in an effort to help the greater good, our government, and both Republicans and Democrats, by the way, are going to raise taxes to astronomical rates on all assets to make up this difference, to bail themselves, the government, and these folks out. And of course, when they do that, those of us who have been putting away for the future, the ones that, that are going to be holding the wealth in the United States of America, and I don't mean that you're super rich, but you are holding wealth, and that, that wealth that you're holding, that's going to be the low-hanging fruit they're going to come to get. That's going to be what they're after and that they can come after first. So for years now, I've been sitting here wondering what I can do, what you can do, to either protect what we have saved or at least minimize the damage that will be done when this happens. I've thought, should all my assets be in land? But man, property taxes, land can get taxed. Land can get taken away. Eminent domain. I mean, you get compensated for that, but there's a ton that can be done there. Stocks, so protected stocks, like a Roth IRA, right? A Roth IRA. You invest in post-tax dollars, and the growth or whatever, it never gets taxed again. I'll come back to that. I have never been able to come up with a good answer to that question, by the way. Everything can be, and for the most part, already is taxed, so right now my land is taxed, our rental houses are taxed, my income is taxed, the growth on my investments is taxed once I realize it, uh, the profits from our livestock is taxed, uh, the things that I purchase when I go to buy them are taxed, and the profit that the person makes that sells that to me is taxed on that profit. Tax, 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 tax. 
And so I just don't have a great answer for what can be done to protect these assets when the need for this bailout finally shows up, when we need to bail out the folks who have been living above their means and we need to bail out the government who also is living above its means. Now, I told you about Roth IRAs. I've got investments in Roth IRAs. And supposedly that money will never be taxed again, including the growth. Great deal, as long as the government keeps its word. But all it takes is a national emergency and then some new legislation to follow that to go right back on that promise and justify going back on that promise. And by the way, any law can be changed. The Constitution can be changed. So even that worries me. Now, that does not... By the way, this is not a financial advice show or episode. I'm not saying don't inv- don't invest in Roth IRAs. I still invest in Roth IRAs because to me, that's my best shot. That's my best shot. But do I sit here and go, oh, the government's going to keep their word and the, this is sacred? It'll never be touched? No. They could, they could absolutely change that and go back on that and say, I'm sorry, the nation needs it. They could totally do that. And so I still continue to invest in Roth IRAs. Again, I think that's the best shot. But... Does that make me think that this day couldn't come? Absolutely not. Now, just a little twist, a little tangent here in this episode. I've got to talk about motorcycles for a minute. I promise you this ties into the ending of all this. About a year and a half ago, I decided to buy a small motorcycle uh, to use for hunting here in Idaho. And I purchased uh, a used Yamaha TW200 from a guy that lived about 10 miles from me. And there were several factors that led me to, to... purchase this bike um, and this bike was street legal you can ride it on the road that had that had nothing to do with my purchase I could have cared less at that point in time about ever riding a motorcycle on the road it was not something I wanted to do uh, but I purchased this early in November of 2018 which meant that hunting season was over so it was a great time to purchase the bike because winter was coming hunting season was over the demand for these bikes had plummeted you can get a very good price but it meant that I'd have to wait for a year to go hunting off of this motorcycle. And I had just bought this new toy, right? So I wanted to ride it while I had the chance. So I'd ride it around the farm a little bit and stuff, but I, you know, that got old pretty quick. And then uh, every now and then I would load it in the back of the pickup. I would take it out to the desert, go for a longer ride, maybe devote an afternoon to it or something like that. And it was all a lot of fun. Um, and by the way, I'd never been a motorcycle rider before, so I had a lot to learn and I wanted to, to get learning on this bike. Uh, but going out to the desert for the afternoon or whatever, while fun, took a lot of time and I'm a very busy person. And so I needed a way to go riding on this more frequently than that. And what struck me was, well, if I was licensed, I could ride it on the road and I could get a lot more rides in just running into town or something like that. And I was very scared of riding a motorcycle out in traffic on the road, but I thought, well, just a quick run into town, that shouldn't be that big a deal. And then I found out in Idaho, you can take a written test and obtain a learner's permit to ride a motorcycle on the road with just a few restrictions. Like you can't ride after dark, can't go on the interstate and things like that. So since this bike was street legal, I decided to go take that test. I went down to the DMV. While I was waiting for my number to be called, I went through the motorcycle manual, studied, and I passed the test, went down, registered the bike for the street, and now I can ride this bike just on any whim on the road to run down to the store, run into town, whatever that may be. And so I started doing that. And it wasn't too long after that that the weather started getting a lot colder. I knew the ice and the snow was coming, and so my road riding was going to be ending for the winter. I mean, after all, we were having a warm November. I was getting really an extended riding season, uh, luckily for me, out of this. And so it occurred to me that riding was about to be over for me, and it was surprising me how much I was actually enjoying riding the motorcycle on the road and using it as a mode of transportation. And it got such great gas mileage, too. It was saving me a ton on gas in that way. And so I wanted to continue doing it. Well, winter was coming. It was going to totally shut me down, but we were going to be heading down to Texas to see Autumn's family for about 10 days at Christmas. And I thought, well, why don't... I take the motorcycle with me. It'll be warm down there. I can ride it while I'm down there. Well, Texas doesn't recognize an Idaho learner's permit for a motorcycle. So I hurried and I took the skills test and I actually passed that and I was able to get fully licensed to ride a motorcycle in Idaho and thus anywhere in the United States. 
So I got my motorcycle endorsement, and we took the the motorcycle with us to Texas. I rode it down there a little bit, um, and one thing led to another, and I found myself really enjoying having a motorcycle and riding on the road. So this led me to purchase another motorcycle uh, last spring. I've had it almost a year now, and I actually already sold the TW200, um, and now I've got this other motorcycle, a bigger, nicer motorcycle you do longer trips on. And of course, I have been sucked into the vortex of this motorcycle culture, which I'm enjoying every second of it, so don't feel too bad for me. But it's been a lot of fun, but yes, I got sucked right into this. And so with that said, here we are. Uh, I'm recording this on February 10th. So we're just in the waning stages of winter. Uh, if we get a day above 45 degrees, I'm seeing a lot of people riding their motorcycles. Um, so it's about time to start riding again. But it's been a long winter with no riding and going out into my garage and just seeing my motorcycle sitting there and wanting to ride. So if you can't ride over the winter, what can you do? And for me, the answer is you can watch other people ride. And I've been doing that on YouTube and on Amazon Prime Video when I have a moment. So there are three separate, I guess, motorcycling journals that I've been watching that have been kind of kind of helping me get through the winter. And I'm bringing these up for a specific reason. Uh, one is on YouTube. It's called Silk Road on a Honda NC750X. That's the motorcycle I bought, so that's what I've got and one of the reasons I watched it. The other is a great documentary uh, or really just a motorcycling journal uh, filmed firsthand by the writer called Somewhere Else Tomorrow, a documentary about two guys that set out to ride from Germany around the world on motorcycles. It's fantastic. I really, really enjoyed it. No production crew or anything like that. Uh, he just did a good enough job. It was able to become a documentary. And then the next one is called Long Way Round. It's a documentary about the movie star Ewan McGregor. Uh, he played Obi-Wan Kenobi in the newer, you know, the, the first three Star Wars movies, the prequels. Uh, and he and his friend ride around the world, starting in the United Kingdom, and they come through America and back to the United Kingdom. I'm about halfway through the series, so I don't know what happens at the end of this one. But I'm, I'm watching all three of these, and all three of these have something in common, and that is that they all end up riding through Central Asia, and they all encounter a lot of very rural and agricultural people, really mostly sheep and goat herders. And in all three of these series... The riders end up spending time in these people's homes, sharing meals with them, uh, overcoming language barriers, and receiving very, very generous hospitality from their hosts. And watching this and, and thinking about where we're going in the future in our country and the national debt and uh, all the pandering from politicians and things like that, I also I all of a sudden had a new thought, a new thought about the debt and the future and, and the money we've put away and, and our future lives and, and what I, you know, everything I've been talking about, this pessimism. I all of a sudden had a new thought about this and changed my perspective just a little bit. And this is what I wanted to change with you. This is, this is where I'm so happy to be agricultural, so happy to be rural, because I think it frames my perspective differently. And watching these motorcycle videos and seeing these agricultural people in Central Asia is what made me think of it. You watch these videos, and you intuitively know too, but you watch these videos, and you see these folks living in these in these countries. They live in a yurt or something like that. They've got wool clothing on. They've probably got one or two outfits. But they have good quality clothing, right? It's not mass-produced because I need to buy something new tomorrow. It's I'm buying this coat, and it's going to last me a long time. And it works very well. You intuitively know that these people are equally as happy as you are with all your material possessions in the United States. At least I intuitively know that these people are equally as happy as I am here in the United States with all of my material possessions. I think they're equally as content as well. Now, maybe they are not aware or maybe they're not as aware as I am of all the different opportunities there are in the world for travel and for material possessions. I will give you that. But I don't feel like they're any less happy. I don't feel like they're living there miserable, wishing they had more wealth. And they don't have barely any wealth. They're, they're basically subsistence. Basically subsistence. And 
it dawned on me as I'm watching this video that if the time comes that all of the excess in the United States robs me of my life's work, like through high taxes, I'm not going to be happy about that. Of course, I'm not going to be happy about that. But whatever happens, it's not going to rob me of my happiness. And watching these villagers in these videos and seeing that they're happy, seeing that they're content, while they don't have tons of material possessions or wealth, was just a great reminder of what really is important. Now, there is a scene in the docuseries Long Way Round, the one with Ewan McGregor, in which they're staying in a goat herder's home somewhere in the middle of Mongolia. And it is the middle of nowhere Mongolia. Like the only time I've seen a landscape this devoid of people, vehicles, anything, is probably the middle of Nevada or eastern Oregon. Uh, not a bad thing, by the way. But, I mean, they are the middle of nowhere in Mongolia. And in this vast open prairie, the family has put together one pin, at least from what I saw in the video, one pin where they can catch their goats. So if they need to castrate goats or uh, to do X, Y, and Z, collect some up to be butchered or whatever that may be, they can capture them in this one pin. And other than that, it is just free ranging for these goats. And just like we would in the United States, these villagers, when they're visiting with themselves or like with these guests on the docuseries, they're doing it outside, leaning on the rails of their pin, looking at their livestock, just like we would do here in the United States. And they're having their conversations there, and they're, they're getting pleasure from watching their animals and watching their livestock move around. And it dawned on me that this entertainment costs no money, and it definitely helps you to feel content. And this is where I think all of us in agriculture and in rural areas to some extent are very, very lucky. And it doesn't matter if it's row crops. It doesn't matter if it's livestock. I believe that we derive so much of our happiness from the everyday things that do not cost us any money. Uh, one of the things I've talked about on the show so many times is the four seasons. Now, I'm not a row crop farmer. We raise livestock. I like, I like livestock. That's my thing. But in, in the area I live where so much farming goes on, and by the way, disappearing quickly with uh, urban sprawl, but another episode. Uh, so much of the agriculture that goes on, I love it because of the four seasons. So, you know, winter is the toughest because there's, there's little going on and things are dead and it's gray and it's cold and all of that. But every now and then we get some really cool weather. We get some cool snow or something like that or some really cold temperatures that makes life interesting. But right about now, people are calving. People are kidding. Uh, for 4-H, people will be farrowing pretty quick. Uh, you know, stuff like that's going on. It's not going to be another week or two. People are really going to be working the ground up uh, around where I'm at. Uh, because of our soils here, a lot of guys work their ground up in the fall because it's too difficult to work up in the spring. Uh, but uh, a lot of ground has worked already. But pretty soon, we're going to be seeing stuff go in. Uh, with new varieties, we'll see corn being planted earlier. We're going to see winter wheat coming up. All of this, and then in March, they're going to be filling the canals with water. Uh, people are going to start irrigating that early. A lot more planting is going to be going on. You're going to be seeing calves and kids and, and, and lambs everywhere in fields as you drive around. And then by midsummer, it's going to be hot, uh, but you're going to be, see, you'd be seeing corn up, you know, two and a half, three feet tall. By August, it's going to be up above your head. Driving down the road, it'll be tunnels of corn. I mean, I just love it, and there's just this variety that you get to see these changes all throughout the year. It's not the same day after day after day after day. Everything's changing. It costs you zero dollars, zero dollars, and it gives you this sense of contentedness. You know, and I just believe that those of us in ag, we get such a large percentage of our happiness and our contentedness from these things that cost us no money. You know, being around family, feeling the sun on our face, sleeping soundly after a hard day's work, uh, watching the baby calves, watching the kids kick up their heels, uh, the great sunsets, the wide open spaces, hearing the birds and the bugs in the evening, watching the chickens peck as they run around the yard before, you know, the sun's going down. All of these things and so many more that I, I could probably brainstorm three lists of them are the focus of our lives. And we're really lucky in that respect because we're not reliant 
on material goods to be happy or to be content. And so if tomorrow, if it was all taken away from us because taxation just went through the roof with what I've been talking about, and we had to go back to living like it was the late 19th century, like in terms of wealth is what I'm talking about, it would not mean that our lives were ruined. It would just mean that our lives were changed, that they were different. But it definitely would not mean that we could not be happy or content. I still think we would be very happy, very content, because the reason we love this lifestyle is for all these things that we love that cost no money. And those would all still be there. They would all still be there. Now, if you got bankrupted and you had to move to the city, that's a different deal. And that's not what I'm talking about. But but taxes go up to... 65% to bail out all these people who have just lived for today, including the government. They go up to 70% or whatever. My guess is we still get to continue to live this lifestyle. Things would just look a lot different, but we would still have all of these things. And I think we're really, really lucky that we value these so much. And I know all of you do because I do, and you're listening and you're part of this audience, which means we've got this in common. So when the day comes that our country has to pay this bill and it's going to come, I don't really expect it to be so catastrophic that we go into a Great Depression or something like that, but I do think that those of us who have built wealth are going to have some of it taken away and it's going to be given to the folks who did not bother to do that and that's going to be a tough pill to swallow. And if I'm alive to see that day, I'm not going to be happy with that happening, but I am going to be happy that I have based my values uh, in work and accomplishment and things that don't cost any money. And I'm going to be very happy for all of you that are the same. There is no question that uh, we are still going to be able to find that same satisfaction, that same happiness that we enjoy today. No question about that. And I'm just so happy that we've got our priorities shifted in that direction to kind of help us shield us from when this day comes. Hopefully it doesn't. I don't see how we avoid it. At some point, it does have to happen. So kind of a different episode for me today, everybody. It's something I've had on my mind I wanted to share with you, and uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Have a great day.